All right, we ready to get started? Very good. Uh, we had some questions emailed in advance, so I'll start with those. And thanks for joining us tonight. So first question, Jesus said in Matthew 24 that it would be like in Noah's day, people marrying and given in marriage, which I believe is in the tribulation. So in 2 Timothy, when Paul says about forbidding to marry, is that also the tribulation or the last days of the age of grace? So let's get Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Let's get Matthew 24 and we'll look at verse 37. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now when we consider the chart, when you think about when Matthew 24, 37 was spoken, the chart would have looked like this. There, there was no knowledge that had been revealed about the dispensation of grace at that time. So when Matthew 24, 37 says, as the days of, of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, it's clearly a reference to the second coming. And so it's saying that the second coming is very much like the days of Noe. Now look at verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The idea there is that what happened before the flood is people were just going on with their normal business. They were marrying and giving in marriage, they were eating and drinking, they were planning, they were doing all kinds of things. And of course, what was about to happen? Well, the flood was about to happen and all of their plans were going to be rendered completely irrelevant. Same thing is going to happen at the second coming. People are going to act as if things are just going to continue the way they are. When the Lord returns, things drastically change. The, the flood is a time of judgment. The second coming is also a time of judgment. So hopefully you see what's going on in Matthew 24. Let's compare that to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. So 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So when Paul writes about the latter times in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, what time is he talking about? And what I'll suggest to you is that what Paul is talking about in 1 Timothy 4, 1 is the latter times of the dispensation of grace. So when we were looking at Matthew 24, Matthew 24 is about the time right before the second coming. That's part of the prophetic calendar. What Paul's describing in 1 Timothy 4 when he refers to latter times, I believe he's referring to the latter times of the dispensation of grace. In other words, the times shortly before the rapture. So Matthew 24 and 1 Timothy 4 are talking about different times. You see that. <clears throat> now, notice something else on verse 1 before we move on. It says that some depart from the faith. Why do they depart from the faith? It says they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So clearly what happens during the latter times is there are doctrines of of devils. Many people think of devilish warfare today as tempting people to do bad things or haunting houses or possessing people. And there's no evidence whatsoever in the scripture that, that devils possess anyone during the dispensation of grace. Uh, certainly not today. <laughs> they don't haunt houses. What is it that they do? They create 
they propagate doctrines of devils. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now notice verse 3, forbidding to marry. So apparently in latter times there is some, uh, something taught as a doctrine that forbids to marry. And then notice what it says, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So based upon 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, can you teach veganism as a required scriptural diet? And the answer is you can't, right? And the reason why you can't is every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. You can voluntarily choose to be a vegan today if you want to for whatever reason. That, that's within your freedom. But can you teach as a doctrine that other people need to follow that diet? You can't because every creature of God is good. Now go back to verse 3 just for a minute. And it says, commanding to abstain from meats. So apparently one of the things that happens in the latter times is there will be people teaching the doctrines of devils that say, you have to abstain from meats. So that's one of those teachings that's just going to happen. And when it does, it will clearly be unscriptural and people that are scriptural minded should ignore it, not pay any attention to it. <clears throat> but if you notice verse 3, or in verse 1, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Will there be people in the latter times that depart from the faith, meaning they were in the faith, but they then choose to depart from it? And the answer is yes, they will, because there will be seducing spirits that draw them away with these doctrines of devils, and they'll believe it. So the end of the dispensation of grace, what that tells you is it's a time of doctrinal departure is a time of doctrinal apostasy because people that are in the faith abandon the faith. <clears throat> Next question here, same, this is a continuation of the question, was that a prophecy given to Paul for us? And the answer is yes. So if you look at 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, that's a Pauline prophecy. When people tend to think about prophecy today, what they do all the time is they go to the Old Testament and they look for what I'll call geographic or geopolitical prophecies. They like ones where it talks about this country will do this. And they like them, I think, because then what they can do is they can look at current events and they can say, aha, this thing that I'm reading about that's a current event it's the fulfillment of something in Ezekiel. But let me ask you this question. Can Old Testament prophecy be fulfilled during the dispensation of grace? It can't for the following reason. Okay, you ready? Here's a fun analogy. Think of football, basketball, Think of any sport that has a game clock. Now here's my question. How much of the, the, the game time, so for example, football, it takes 60 minutes. How much of that 60 minutes ticks off during a timeout? None. None because the purpose of a time out is to do what? To stop the clock, right? The whole reason you call time out is you want the clock to stop. Well, think about this with me. What was the dispensation of grace? It was a time out. It was an interruption of the prophetic clock. So let me show you this. I'm going to hide the dispensation of grace again. So imagine yourself in Acts 2. In Acts 2, when Peter stands up and by the Holy Ghost, he says, 
This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Guess what was happening at that time? The prophecy that was mentioned by Joel. Well, and let's just look at it together. Get Acts 2. Get Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and so on. Verse 19, And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great notable day of the Lord come. Now just notice with me on the chart. If you think about Acts 2, when Peter says this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and he mentions things that are going to happen, is he saying these things are going to happen in the next 2,000 years? No. He's saying these things are going to happen in due course. If you recall, the Lord Jesus Christ during His earthly ministry said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. There be some standing here that shall see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And the reason why He said that is they were within one generation, they were within 40 years of the second coming. What God did with the dispensation of grace is He interrupted, He called a time out in the prophetic program to prevent prophecy from being fulfilled. So when people think, well, you know, what's going on in the Middle East is the fulfillment of something in Ezekiel 36, it can't be. It cannot be because you live during the dispensation of grace, which is a timeout in the prophetic program. The prophecies that Paul did give us, he never says, this is going to happen in Syria. He never says, this is going to happen in, in Lebanon. He never says anything like that. What he says, as in 1 Timothy 4, is he talks about the spiritual condition of the end of the dispensation of grace. It's going to be a departure from the faith. There's going to be seducing spirits, doctrine of devils, and we're even told what some of those doctrines will be. So if you want to, if you want to gauge where you are in terms of how close to the end of the dispensation of grace, when do you see things like 1 Timothy 4 occurring, where there are people departing from the faith, and giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So here's the next question. This is all part of one question. Do you think we will have a part to play here on earth during the tribulation, maybe in the spiritual realm, unseen? So, is there a role for the body of Christ during the tribulation? So look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, then what does it say? Eternal in the heavens. So where is the body of Christ designed to function in the heavens, not on the earth. So I'm not aware of any reason to think there's a role for the body of Christ on the earth during the tribulation. Next question. If we die before the rapture, do we go to the new Jerusalem in heaven, or is it in heaven but separate from the part of heaven that we go to? So the question, I think, is this. When you die as a member of the body of Christ before the rapture, do you go up into heaven and are you present in the New Jerusalem? Well, what's the New Jerusalem going to do? Where's the New Jerusalem going to end up? It's going to end up on the earth. Does the body of Christ end up on the earth? No. So if you look with me, actually you're in 2 Corinthians 5. So look with me at verse 8, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when you're absent from the body, when you die today, where are you? You're present with the Lord. Now, you're not in 
the new Jerusalem because that's not your eternal inheritance, but you are present with the Lord. All right, so that was the, that was the first question. A lot of good questions there. So we'll move on to the next one. The next one is this. If the church dispensation, and we'll just call that the dispensation of the grace of God, if the dispensation of the grace of God did not start until the Apostle Paul was commissioned, why is it that the period of Pentecost until Paul's commissioning is not part of the seven-year tribulation? So let's make sure we understand the question here. So if the dispensation of grace didn't start until the Apostle Paul was commissioned, and that's true, the dispensation of grace starts with who? Starts with Paul. Why is it that from Pentecost until Paul's commissioning, that that's not part of the seven-year tribulation? Well, let's go to Daniel 9. So we need to understand what Scripture teaches about the 70 weeks. So let's look at Daniel chapter 9. There are some that teach that in the early part of the book of Acts, part of the 70th week already occurred. And then the rest of the 70th week will occur after the rapture. But that doesn't really make any sense, and I'll show you why. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks. We often think of a week as a period of seven days. In Daniel 9, the week here is a reference to seven years. So 70 weeks would be how many years then? 490 years. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So what the Lord is telling Daniel here is there's 70 weeks, there's 490 years to accomplish these things. Now, verse 25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So verse 25 says there's going to be a commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. And there's going to be a period of time from that until the time of Messiah the Prince. And how long is it? Well, it's seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So if you add those all together, how many is that? So how much is three score? So a score is 20. So three score is 60. So we have seven plus 60 plus 2. So what is that up to? 69. So there's 69 weeks in verse 25. Now notice verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, so this is after the seven and then after the three score and two, shall Messiah be cut off. Now when it talks about Messiah being cut off, what event is that? That's the cross. That would be the crucifixion. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now let's make sure we understand very carefully what verse 26 says. Does it say, at the end of the 69th week, or does it say after? Do you see how it says after? And after three score and two weeks? My point is, what people want to do is they'll say the 69th week ended 
with the Messiah being cut off, and then the 70th week started the very next day. So what, what often happens with us, of course, is if you think of the last day of the week, let's, let's call it Saturday, what happens immediately after Saturday? Well, then the next week immediately begins. But when you read verse 69, there's numerous events that take place after the 69th week. Notice this. It says, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Well, that's the cross. And then it says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, that didn't happen at the exact same time Messiah was cut off. That happened much later. And by the way, when that happened in the first century, I don't believe it was the fulfillment of that verse. But even if you believe it was, my point is, did it all happen at the same time? It didn't. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And then notice this, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. There's a number of things that take place there, and they don't all occur on the same day. Now, notice verse 27, and this is very helpful. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So the one week there is the last week we're looking for. It's the 70th week. Notice what it says. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Well, does the 70th week start immediately after the 69th? It doesn't because it has to be confirmed. So let's read the whole thing. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What verse 27 is referring to is it's referring to Daniel's 70th week. And we know that in the middle of that 70th week, after three and a half years, the abomination of desolation is set up. Now get with me Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Let's start in verse 1. Also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So from the time that this prophecy is spoken, there has to be three kings arise in Persia, and then they stir up against two the realm of Grecia. Now notice verse 3. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. In verse 3, when it talks about a mighty king, and it's, it happens to be in Grecia, that shall rule with great dominion, who do you think that is? It's Alexander the Great. Now notice verse 4, And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity. Isn't that interesting? So what it tells you is it tells you the fourfold division of Alexander the Great's empire. It tells you years, 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 decades, decades in advance that it's not going to go to his posterity. It wasn't going to go to his descendants. It would go to his generals. According to his dominion which he ruled, for the, his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. So that's what happens to Grecia. After, after Persia, Persia is overcome by Grecia. After Alexander the Great, his kingdom is divided. Now notice verse 5. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Now notice verse 6. 
and in the end of years, so it's talking, it's moving forward in time, they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north." So the king of the south shall come into his own land and shall return into his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through then, pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. Verse 11, and the king of the south shall be moved with color and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And you, 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 so go down to verse 15. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount. And go ahead and go down to verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Now notice this. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. The vile person in, in, in verse 21, I believe, is the same person as the prince of the covenant in verse 22. The prince of the covenant is the same person in Daniel 9, 27 that makes the covenant for one week. Now, what's my point in showing you all this? As you read Daniel 11, are there a whole bunch of events that have to take place before the vile person, the prince of the covenant, rises up to make a covenant with Israel? We won't spend the time to look at Revelation, but... The vile person, the beast, is described as the little horn. And the little horn is one of the, of the kings that overcomes the other kings. And I'll simply, I'll, I'll simply put it this way. If you think about what happens with the establishment of the covenant with Israel, it's obvious that the prince of the covenant has to come to power and be in a position to make that covenant with Israel. He has to have the influence to do that. So after the 69th week when Messiah was cut off, was the prince of covenant there, and did he make a covenant with Israel at that time? And the answer is no, he didn't. So what's going to happen after the rapture when the rapture happens, let's say the rapture happens on Thursday, is the signing of the covenant on Friday. It's not, because the events have to take place, so the prince of the covenant comes to power and can then sign the covenant with Israel. So as to the question, did part of the 70th week occur in the early part of the book of Acts? No, none, none of it did. All of that is future. Not only is all of the 70th week future, but parts of Daniel 11 are future. Those events have to take place so the prince of the covenant can come to power and then have Israel sign a covenant with him. So that's the answer to that question. The next one pertains to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So get 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This 
So the question is on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and it's, is the, the catching up the same thing as the day of the Lord? And then what exactly is the sudden destruction? So let's read the first four verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night returns, refers to the second coming. Now, in, in Scripture, let me just ask you this. In the Scripture, who says, I come as a thief? Look with me at uh, Get Revelation, and we'll look at Revelation. We'll look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And verse 3. This is the Lord speaking unto the church in Sardis. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, now notice what he says here, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Well, based upon what you know about other verses, when it talks about I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I shall come, what is that talking about? Well, it's, it's pretty clear it's talking about the second coming. So when Paul talks about the day of the Lord coming as a thief, it is a reference to the second coming which obviously takes place after the body of Christ is already gone at the rapture. Now look with me, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I'll make this point. So, at the end of the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ is caught up at the rapture. When that happens, the dispensation of grace ends, the prophetic timetable resumes and starts to tick forward. The 70th week will subsequently happen, and then, of course, the second coming. So let's read verses 2 and 3 together. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now that's obviously the second coming. Now notice verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now people sometimes wonder the question, they say, well, how can, how can they say peace and safety before the second coming? Because the second coming is going to be a time of destruction, so how can they possibly be saying peace and safety? Do you remember when we were in Matthew 24? Matthew 24 said that the second coming was like what time period? It's like the days of Noah. So let me ask you this question. Think of the day immediately before the flood came. Were people on the earth running around in panic saying, oh, no, no, judgment is coming. It's going to be terrible. We're all going to die. Is that what they were doing? What does Matthew 24 say they were doing? Marrying and giving in marriage and just carrying on with the normal affairs of life. Well, that's the exact thing that's going on there in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. <laughs> what man does, even when the second coming is imminent, what does he say? Peace and safety. Everything's fine. No worries. Don't worry, be happy right? Second coming, I mean, that's all just a fairy tale. You don't need to worry about that. People will say, have the same heart attitude of rebellion 
before the second coming, they'll have the attitude of denial that people had before the flood. They'll say, peace and safety, no worries. But what, what verse 3 says, they say that, but what happens? Sudden destruction, and they shall not escape. Verse 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. What is the simplest, clearest reason why the day of the Lord is not going to overtake the body of Christ? <laughs> Great answer. We're not going to be here because we're going to leave years before it happens. So the body of Christ has nothing to worry about the day of the Lord. Now, of course, if you're not in the body of Christ, then what's going to happen is you're going to miss the rapture. You would then be on earth during, possibly, the tribulation in the 70th week, and you have every reason to worry about that, which is why, of course, the proper sensible thing to do is to get saved during the dispensation of grace by believing the gospel. So that's, that's the explanation of peace and safety and sudden destruction. I'll, I'll, I'll mention one other thing here because it just reminds me of this. If you think about the end of the millennial reign, Satan is loosed for how long? A little season. And when he's loosed for a little season, what does he do? He goes out to deceive the nations of the earth. How many people follow him? Six or seven, 12, 14. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now just think about that with me for a minute. Revelation tells you at the second coming that blood flows for 200 miles at the level of a horse's bridle. Just absolute devastation, right? I mean, just the number of people that are killed is, is just staggering. It's a thousand years later, but you hope someone would have a little bit of a recollection and say, hey, wait a minute. This idea of going up to Jerusalem and killing the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the last time he got really, really angry, it was bad. So maybe we shouldn't do this. The one thing that you learn from history is men never learn from history. And so what happens at the, at the end of the millennium is the destruction of the wicked. All right. I think we have some other questions here. Let's look. So God breathed Adam's soul and spirit into him. Did Eve receive part of Adam's soul and spirit? If not, what, what did God do? It, how, I know I'm just trying to make sense of it. So what happens is, what does God take from Noah to create Eve? A rib. When God takes the rib from Noah, <coughs> it is Noah then incomplete? I was just seeing if you're paying attention. That's why we hesitated on the rib part. Someone died. That's good, yeah. I, 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 someone posted today or yesterday that I said during the Lord's earthly ministry that he went only to Gentiles. Oh my. So I say a lot of dumb things, and you just got to, you know, buyer beware, you know, be careful, be thoughtful. Don't, don't take things that I say as, you know, infallible truth. So let's try again. God creates Adam. What part of Adam does God take to fashion Eve? A rib. A rib. Okay, so good. When God does that, does mankind now have one fewer rib than originally created? What happened? Well, the answer is, if you take a rib, a rib will grow back. Right? Say yes. 
You, you, can, you can look it up. So, so what God did is he takes the rib from Adam, and that's obviously the physical component of his being. When God fashions Eve at that point, obviously, he, he imparts a soul and a spirit unto her. And I think that's just how it happens in terms of his creation. Okay, next question. Did Satan go through any kind of transformation when he fell? So look with me at 2 Corinthians. Look with me at 2 Corinthians and we'll look at, let's look at, uh, let me find the verse I want. Second Corinthians 11, verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself, now notice this next part here, is transformed into an angel of light. When Satan was originally created, what type of being was he? A cherub. In Scripture, what does a cherub look like? So a cherub is this remarkable creature, and it has four faces. It has the face of a lion, an eagle, a man, and an ox, and it has a, a spinning wheel, and it, it's quite complicated. What verse 14 says is Satan is transformed. So Satan apparently has the ability to change his appearance, and he does so as it suits him. What is the appearance that Satan chooses to take upon himself at right before the, the second coming? It's described in Job. He takes upon himself the appearance of the Leviathan, right? So he, 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 he changes his appearance as it suits him. Now, by the way, you can decide for yourself on this. When Genesis 3 describes Satan as a serpent, when Satan was in the Garden of Eden, did he look like a, a snake? Did he slither along the grounds, along the ground? I don't think so. Um, the description of him as a serpent is a description of his <coughs> physical character, excuse me, of his spiritual nature. It's not his physical appearance, right? Did, <coughs> did Eve actually have conversations with the animals? I mean, for, for, forget like fanciful ideas. Did she talk to bears? and said, hello, Mr. Bear. Was it, was it like a Disney movie? And she would talk to the bear and say, Mr. Bear, good morning, how are you? And the bear would say, well, I'm fine, it's good to see you. And do you know there's any honey? And <clears throat> that's all just silly nonsense. You can't talk to a bear. And Eve didn't talk to a snake. <clears throat> what the, the, the description of him as a serpent is a description of him in terms of his spiritual character. Look with me at Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 5. Now notice what Satan says to Eve. Start in verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Well, that's obviously a lie. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Now notice what this says. And ye shall be as, what's the next word? Gods. It's not God, it's God's. 
It's lowercase g gods. Well, what is the lowercase g gods a reference to? Was it like Thor and Zeus? No, it's nothing like that. It, it was angels. But what does that tell you? It tells you that Eve must have had some knowledge of what those gods were like, or it wouldn't have made any sense. If he'd said to her, you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you'll know good and evil, and you'll be just like Darth Vader. What would she have said? Well, this doesn't even make any sense. That's not a temptation. That's nonsense. I don't even know what you're saying. When he says ye shall be as gods, she has to know something of what that means, meaning she had to be familiar with lowercase g gods for that to make sense. Okay. So that is that question. Does, does anyone have any other questions that they want to raise? Anyone have anything? Sir? Satan is script in Scripture is sometimes described as a Leviathan, which is basically a, uh, it's a dragon. And it's a dragon that resides in the water. So look at Job 41, verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan, and notice what it says here, with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou let us down. Now, if you just read verse 1, what's it talking about? It's talking about fishing. What do you do when you fish? Well, you have a hook, and you have to have a cord that you let down to grab, you know, to snag the fish. So, verse 41 is talking about fishing, so to speak. So, obviously, this Leviathan resides in the water. Now, just notice with me a couple things here, but maybe this is the simplest thing to do. Go to verse 33. And, and before you do that, look at verse 21. Oh, do verse 20. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. It's like a dragon, obviously. Isn't that more than clear? <clears throat> Verse 23, The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. He has scales that are like armor. It's, it's just very, very clear that this is a dragon. Verse 27, He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood, and so on. Verse 31, <clears throat> he maketh the deep <clears throat> to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. <clears throat> so clearly this is a dragon. Now notice verse 34. No, <clears throat> no, let's do verse 33. Upon earth <clears throat> there is not his like who is made without fear. Now think with me for a minute. What does that verse tell you about this creature? He, ha <clears throat> he has no fear. Has no fear. And that means that this creature cannot be what? Can't be an animal. 
Why do I say that? What did God do in Genesis 9? So we're coming back to Job 41, but get Genesis 9. Genesis chapter 9. Now, you recall that in Genesis 1, what kind of diet did God give to man? Vegan diet, right? In Genesis 9, watch what changes. And God blessed Noah and his sons, verse 1, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Verse 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So let me ask you this. Based upon verse 2, how many of the animals on the earth fear man? It's very clearly all of them, right? Why is it that they fear man? Verse 3 says that all of these animals, both clean and unclean, were given to man for meat. Meaning that man, in his relation to any animal, might do what? Might kill it and eat it. So guess what an animal was going to feel toward man? I know you. I know what you might be thinking. And that's why the fear of man was upon every animal. Now go back with me to Job 41. Now when you pick up a study Bible and you read in Job 41, they're going to tell you, that this creature in Job 41 is some sort of animal. You follow me? Verse 33 tells you the one thing it cannot be is an animal. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. It just told you it's not anything referenced in Genesis 9. It's not a fish of the sea, a fowl of the air, a beast of the field. It can't be any of those things. Now look at verse 34. So Job 41, verse 34. He beholdeth all high things. Well, how's a creature on earth going to behold all high things? He is a king over all the children of pride. So you get one guess and one guess only as to who this is. Right? It's plainly Satan. Okay. So... The Leviathan is Satan. But if you think about 2 Corinthians 11, obviously Satan's not a Leviathan in 2 Corinthians 11 because he's transformed himself into what? An angel of light. And Satan wasn't a Leviathan in Genesis 3 because Eve wasn't talking to a Leviathan that was in the sea that was breathing fire. He clearly changes his appearance over time, more than obvious. All right, so let's consider one thing further. In Matthew 8, when the devils encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the question that they ask him? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They know the time when he is going to torment them. Now I want you to think with me for a minute. When the Lord deals with the man who is possessed of the legion, what do the devils ask him? If you're going to cast us out, cast us into the swine. Why do the devils want into the swine? Is there any other time in Scripture where someone says, you know what, it'd really be great to live inside a pig. You know, that would be fantastic, right? It'd be so comfortable. Why do the devils want inside swine? 
Is there any reason they would want to do that? Well, what happens is when they're cast out into those swine, what do they immediately do? Well, the swine rush down into the water and drown. Why would you do that? Well, the answer is this. What those devils are doing is exactly what devils will do at the second coming. They will transform themselves into dragons, and where will they hide? In the deeps. And you can run the references on dragons and deeps. So Job 41, the Leviathan reference, is a description of the form that Satan takes shortly before the second coming. So that's how that fits together. Any, okay, we've got another question here. Was the remission of sins in Acts 2.38 comparable to that of the sacrifices under the Levitical priesthood? So <clears throat> the, the, the way to think about that is, is this. And people often ask the question of when do people under the prophetic program obtain forgiveness of sins? So let me ask you this question. <clears throat> if you think of Abraham, when did Abraham receive forgiveness of sins? Did he, re did he receive it when he died? Is he waiting to receive it in the future? What does Scripture say about that? Get Genesis 15. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord. And what happened? And he counted it to him for righteousness. So when did Abram become righteous? When he believed. Now think about this with me for a minute. When Abraham <coughs> believed, Jesus Christ died for his sins yet. <coughs> so had the payment for sin already been made, the answer to that is no. Even though the payment hadn't been made, did God still count Abram righteous? He did, according to Genesis 15. Get with me Romans chapter 4. Get Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Let me give you this example. If, uh, if your refrigerator's broken, and you call me, <laughs> that'd be funny, and I tell you, don't worry about it, I'm going to come over tomorrow and fix your refrigerator. Would you say, Whew, that's fantastic. I'm not even worrying about it because Dave said he's going to come over tomorrow and he'll take care of it, so why worry? Now, that example is absurd because obviously I can't fix a refrigerator. But let's say you called someone competent. You called a competent person and they said that they were going to fix it. Would you still be sure that it's going to happen? Or have you learned in life that sometimes people say that they're going to do things and it doesn't happen? Well, what happens in human affairs is <clears throat> life experience teaches you that irrespective of men, what men say, you don't really know if it's going to happen until it does, right? 
So the safest, most prudent thing to do is to just wait and see if it happens. Did God have to do that? In, in Genesis 15, when Abraham has faith, does God say, you know, most likely he's going to end up righteous because odds are Jesus Christ will probably die for his sin. Is that how God thought about it? Or did God think about it as, I know with certitude that Jesus Christ will come, will die for his sin, make a complete payment. And since I know that's going to happen, when Abraham has faith, I'm not going to wait to declare him righteous in the future. I'm going to count him righteous immediately because I know the payment is going to happen. You see the point? Think with me about Leviticus. Leviticus has a feast called the Day of Atonement. And that feast has a future fulfillment at the time of the second coming. So during the, the Old Testament, people would observe that feast, but the true fulfillment of it doesn't happen until the second coming. Well, does God sit up in heaven and say, well... I don't want to get ahead of myself. So I think the Day of Atonement will ultimately be fulfilled. But just to be safe, I'm not going to count it until it happens. That's not how God does things. Because God has absolute certitude of what's going to happen. He knew that Jesus Christ was going to offer the sacrifice for sins. He knows that all of the typology about the Day of Atonement will be fulfilled. And therefore, the moment that a man has faith, such as Abraham, what does God do? He counts it for righteousness at that time. <clears throat> Look with me, at, at, you're in Romans 4. Look at verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead. Now notice this part. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. What happens to Abraham and Sarah when they get on in years? They say, well, you know, God promised to make of us, you know, this great nation, but look, we're not seeing it. So maybe, maybe that was fake news. Maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe we need to try something else. Man was starting to doubt. Was God worried? God wasn't worried. You see the point. So <clears throat> a way to think about this is God knows exactly the provision that he is going to make for man. And because he knows that, he counts people as righteous the moment they have faith. He's not waiting on that because he knows that the sacrifice is ultimately going to be provided. All right. Any final questions anyone has? Is that why pigs still squeal today? I don't know about that one. Um, all right. Well, <clears throat> thanks everyone for the questions. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its, its perfection, its truth, its availability. We pray, Lord, that we would be busy studying it, that we would be renewing our minds in knowledge and that we would glorify you in all that we do. We give thanks for everything that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.